you have your Bible, the, 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 your phone, the iPad, the church app, Hebrews chapter one, verse four. We are going to continue in our series in, in Hebrews. We're going to continue on in this series today as we took time and to honor you moms and love you. And I, and I, and the Lord's gave me, gave me some things to encourage you moms with, hopefully, uh, uh, at different parts of the message as well. But we will continue our series, uh, today because if you, if you haven't noticed, if you ever read, there's a lot of stuff in Hebrews, <laughs> and so uh, we're gonna keep keep going along today. And so, uh, uh, so I'm excited. I've been enjoying studying it and teaching it. Uh, this is week two. Last week I laid the foundation and gave you an overview of the book of Hebrews, and I said it's a book of five things: evaluation, exhortation, uh, examination, expect expectation and uh, exaltation. And so if you missed that message last week, go YouTube, Facebook, uh, Vimeo, any one of those, our app, you can you can catch up on the foundation and the overview. I called it highlights in Hebrews. Today we're going to finish up chapter one and all of chapter two because it's primarily dealing with the same subject, which is Jesus Christ is greater than angels. That's what Hebrews is saying. Okay, Miss Vanessa and my wife believes that. Jesus Christ is greater than angels. We're going to talk about angels today. We're going to, angels are real. They're in the Bible. We talk about them a lot uh, just in these, this section. So I'm really breaking up this book into sections. I am going line by line through the whole book, but I'm breaking it up into sections. And because uh, I didn't write the book, and we, as we, we, we don't know who did, but the, the man who wrote it, uh, that we, we, he broke it up into different sections. And even though it's broken up into different chapters and verses, he predominantly is talking about this. See, angels is an, were an important part of the Jewish religion, primarily because thousands of angels assisted in the giving of the law uh, of Moses. This fact is stated in several scriptures, both O and uh, a New Testament. Here, let's look at a couple of them. Deuteronomy 33, 2 says, and he said, the Lord came down uh, from Sinai and down on from dawned on them from Seir. He shunned forth from Mount Paran and he came from the midst of ten thousand holy ones. That that term holy ones means angels. In his right hand there was flashing lightning for them. This next verse in, in the book of Acts, it's Stephen preaching to the uh, to the high council of the priests in the book of Acts about Jesus. Look what he says plainly, Acts 7.53. You deliberately disobey God's law, even though you received it from the hand of angels. And then Galatians 3.19, the apostle Paul says, why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. Remember, that's the whole point of the law. Right, me and Pastor Kelly went through the Ten Commandments last year in a series, and we showed that's one of the primary reasons for it. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. Who was that child? Jesus. That's right. God gave His law through angels to Moses, who is the mediator between God and the people. So, as we saw last week, as a one of the things that's a, a theme of Hebrews is the superiority of Christ and His salvation over the law of Moses. Remember. This is the book of Hebrews. He's writing to Jewish Christians, Jews who were once in the Jewish religion that now have come to faith in Christ. And so that, that's that been the theme here. So he knew he would have to deal with the subject of angels. So this long section we're going to dive into today is really divided into three sections. The first part uh, in verses Hebrews 1, 4, and 14 is an affirmation of the superiority of Christ and the angels. Then Hebrews 2, 1, 1 through 4 is going to be an exhortation to us. Remember, it's a book of exhortation, encouragement to to read and to pay attention and to carefully obey the word of God. This includes the readers, still us today. And then finally, Hebrews uh, 2, 5 through 18 is an explanation of how Christ in a human body can still be superior to angels who are spirits. Come on, let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Holy Spirit, ask that you would help me today as I continue to preach your word. Help me to rightly divide the word of truth. Help me to preach with clarity. Uh, uh, and, and thank you for the authority of your word. Thank you for the honor and privilege to preach today to my brothers and sisters. Lord, I cannot do this on my own, nor do I want to. Lord, I need your help. And would you help us all to receive it and to apply it to our lives? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's jump in. Number one, why is Christ superior to the angels? Well, this section, first of all, is made up of seven quotes. This, what we're going to read here, this first section, is made up of seven quotes from the Old Testament, all which prove the superiority of Christ to angels. Scholars tell us that the writer quoted from the Greek version of the uh, uh, Hebrew Old Testament, known as the Septuagint. The word Septuagint is a Greek word that means 70. Claim, uh, tradition claims that 70 men translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. And that's what he's, he's quoting from here. 
Also, among ancient Jewish and Greek interpreters of the Old Testament, uh, they would, they would string together or they would have chain quotations called pearl stringings. They did this to convince the hearers or readers of certain theological points presenting a lot of scriptural evidence together, which we still do today. As you notice, every Sunday, whether it's me or Pastor Todd or Pastor Kelly, we do the same thing. That's how we've been taught and trained. My pastor always told me, if you have a point without a scripture, it's just your opinion, right? And so I'm not just standing up here, we can and we got to give you my opinion. I want to try my best, preferably give you the truth of the Word of God. But that's what the right of Hebrews, he, again, he's, he's talking to Hebrews, Hebrew people that would know all these Old Testament scripture, and he uses them to convince them that Christ is superior. So let's look at the affirmations that are made about our Lord Jesus and the quotes from uh, the Old Testament to support him. Let's start with the first four, two verses, Hebrews 1, 4, and 5. It says, this shows that the Son is far greater than the angels, just as the name God has given him is greater than their names. For God never said to any angel that he, what he said to Jesus, you are my son, today I have become your father. God also said, I will be his father and he will be my son. Now the greater name is not the name of Jesus. The greater name he's referring to that Jesus possesses is son. That's the greater name that he has. While the angels are called sons of God, you can see that in, in Job 1.6, no angel would be given this title individually. It belongs uniquely to our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the son of God, amen, which makes him equal with God. So the first quote, quote you are my son, today I've become your father, is from Psalm 2.7. Paul also pinpoints this later on in Scripture, uh, or earlier in Scripture, where we see it, whether the order is in the book of Acts, of when this sonship actually uh, uh, came to be. Acts 13, 33, it says, And God has, has now fulfilled it for us, their descendants, by raising Jesus. This is what the second psalm says about Jesus. You know, here, here goes, actually, Luke actually wrote Acts, and he quotes the same verse. You are my son, today I've become your father. He's saying whenever Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, here's Paul in Romans 1, 4, it says, And he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. As I said, for the Easter service, the resurrection of Jesus declares he is the son. Amen? He is the son of God. And that's the greater name he was given. The second quote here is, I will be his father and he will be my son. And this is from 2 Samuel 7.14. The immediate application is David's experience with his son Solomon, who God would love and discipline as a son. But the ultimate application is Jesus Christ, who is greater than Solomon. He is greater than all. We always say Solomon is the widest man, wisest man to ever walk the face of the earth. Yes, he was the wisest man that was fully human. But we know Jesus was fully human and also fully God. He is the living word of God, right? The third quote, Hebrews 1.6. Let's continue on now. I haven't read these yet. And when he brought his firstborn son into the world, God said, let all of God's angels worship him. Now, I really don't have to go any further, really, right there, because we know if angels are worshiping Jesus, right, that he is superior. But I am going to still go line by line and and, and go uh, for it and let you know the term firstborn here in the Bible, it doesn't always mean born first. God made Solomon, for example, the firstborn, even though Solomon is listed 10th in the official genealogy in First Chronicles 3. The title of firstborn is one of rank and honor, for the firstborn receives the inheritance and the special blessing. Now, sometimes it was the one that was born first, but in this case, like Colossians 1.15 tells us, that Christ is the firstborn of all creation. Well, we know Jesus wasn't the first person born on this planet, right? He's the firstborn of all creation because he created all things, and he's the highest of all who came back from the dead. The Bible also tells us he's the firstborn of the resurrection as well. So when he came into the world, the angels worshipped him. And this is a quote from Deuteronomy 20, I'm sorry, 32, 43. God commanded them to worship Jesus. And this proves that Jesus Christ is God, for none of God's angels would ever worship a mere created being. Amen? The fourth quote in is found in verse 7, Hebrews 1, 7. Regarding the angels, he says, he sends his angels like the winds, his servants like flames of fire. See, this is a quote from Psalm 104.4. And both the Hebrew and Greek word uh, for wind is translated spirit. So we see here that angels are created spirits that don't have bodies, although they can assume the form of human bodies uh, when they come to earth. Because again, it says they were servants, right? 
Angels sometimes serve Jesus. We see this in the Gospels when he was on earth and they still uh, serve him and us now. And we'll see that a little bit more in a minute. Next, the fifth quote, Hebrews 1, 8, 9. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, endures forever and ever, and you rule with a scepter of justice. You love justice and hate evil. Therefore, O God, your God has anointed you, pouring out the oil of joy on you more than anyone else. These verses were quoting Psalm 45, 6 and 7. And proclaim the Son as a divine, just, eternal, and anointed King of the universe. Amen. Well, some of y'all didn't get that. I think I, he is. The, let me say it again. He is the son is the divine, just, eternal and anointed king of the universe. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Right. When they nailed that on the cross that he was the king of the Jews. That's just a little part of it. He was the king of the Jews, but he's the king of the universe. Supreme to all. Jesus is, and we see here, is addressed as God. Hebrew quotes this and is addressing it. Jesus is God, and when he says you're God, is a reference to God the Father. Now, olive oil was used to anoint kings of Israel in their inauguration of their rule. God has anointed his son, Jesus Christ, as king. Sixth quote we see here, Hebrews 1, verses 10 and 12, says this, and he also says to the son in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth and made the heavens with your hands. They will perish, but you remain forever. They will wear out like old clothing. You will fold them up like a cloak and disregard them like old clothing. But you are always the same. You will live forever. This quote comes from Psalm 102, 25 through 27. Jesus Christ is the creator. It says he was there that laid the foundations of the earth. And one day he will do away with the old creation and bring about a new creation. See, everything around us constantly changes, but he never changes, right? Hebrews 13, 8 even says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Isn't it amazing to think that just like whenever clothes or a blanket or, or something, a sheet, or any part of uh, uh, clothing is, is worn out for us, even when it's dirty, we just take it, we fold it up, and we either give it away or we throw it away. Think about the Bible is saying that this is what Jesus is going to do with all of the universe. With all of the earth, he's going to fold it up, right? Some of you are just like, you're going to fold up your clothes tonight or put them in the washer or whatever. He's going to do that with everything we see. Come on, somebody. That's the God we serve. Not only, and that's what's awesome. We always say he's the creator. Not only is he the creator of the universe, come on, he's going to fold it all up and do away with it and create a new heavens and a new earth. Come on, somebody. Amen. Just like he created us, a new creation. We were born once. Thank you, mamas. All you mamas. We here because of mamas. We were born once, but then when we got saved, we were born again, right? He made us into a new creation, and he's going to make everything new as well, everything that we see. Amen. The last quote is found in Hebrews 1, 13 and 14. And God never said to any of the angels, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. Therefore, again, angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people. Who will inherit salvation? In this climactic fashion, uh, the author ends his string of Old Testament quotations by quoting Psalm 110, verse 1, in celebration of Christ's exaltation in the place of honor at God's right hand. See, the image here is of Christ's enemies as his footstool under him shows absolutely subjection to the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. See, in the ancient world, a victorious king would place his foot on the neck or the back of an enemy as a symbolic act of domination, right? And so uh, it would be impossible to do away with the evidence presented here in these quotations showing that Jesus Christ is absolutely superior to angels. And let me just, before I move on from this point, we see it again. Therefore, angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people who inherit eternity. And so I, I, I'm, I'm glad to be going through this book and talking about this because we see that angels are real, right? Angels still do exist. Angels still do come to, to, to the earth. But at the same time, we got to remember Christ is superior and that people have kind of got a little wonky about an angels over time. Wonky is not in the Bible. You won't find it in there. It's not a theological term, but, but, it, but it, it, it has happened. And so I love that even the reader is making it clear. Listen, we know angels do exist. They're spirits. They, they do take the form of human bodies. You read about it in, in the Bible. They were talking to men who we know it was angels because the Bible tells us that. And they do. They, they're here but as servants to protect us and to watch over us. And you've probably heard stories. I just want to tell one real quick. I heard about 
But again, I want to keep our focus on Christ. There was a story that said it was a real life account of there was a man that was attacking women uh, on, I think, a college campus. And one night they ended up catching him and they interrogated him. And he admitted that that night he was going after another woman that he was planning on attacking. Uh, and they asked him, why didn't you carry it out? And he said, well, I was planning on it. But when she got out of her car and was walking to like her dorm, she had two big men walking on each side of her. So I wasn't about to mess with those guys. Later, they talked to the lady and said what he was planning. She said, I didn't have anybody with me. I was by myself from when I walked from my car to my place. Come on, somebody. I believe that was angels. Two big men in the, he saw in the spirit what was going on there, right? God allowed him to see that he, she had angels around him, right? So again, we know they're real. We know they're ministering spirit. The Bible latest tells us sometimes when we entertain strangers, we're actually entertaining angels. The Bible says that. So, hey, be careful how you treat somebody, right? You just never know, right? We're supposed to be Christ-like anyway, but, you know, you may run across an angel in heaven and be like, oh, man, that was you. I'm so sorry. You know, like, right? We never know. I don't know. But, but again, the reader, and I think this is a great transition into the second point, the reader takes a sharp, like, not a detour because he mentions angels in this next few verses, but I think, again, we know all this. Christ is superior, but we must stay focused on Jesus and the truths of the Word of God. Because people have, again, started, I think some people have put just as much maybe, uh, 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 um, you know, focus on maybe angels as the, the Lord or the Word himself. So look at verse, I mean, number two in verses one through four, he encourages us to be careful not to drift away from the Word of God, period. And he's still, he's on, he's still on the subject of, uh, he talks about angels here, but he really, there's a warning here. Verse verse 1 in, in chapter 2 says, So we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. For the message God delivered through angels has also stood firm. He's talking about, again, the law. And every violation of the law and every act of disobedience was punished. So what makes us think we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself and then delivered to us by those who by those who heard him speak. And God confirmed the message, the message of salvation, by giving signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit whenever he chose. See, this is one of first of five warnings found in the book of Hebrews. This purpose is to encourage us, again, to pay attention to God's word and to obey it. These warnings become stronger as we progress through the book of Hebrews. It goes from drifting from God's word to straight up defying God's word. We also see that God does not just sit by and permit his children to rebel against him. He will speak and he will, if necessary, discipline his own children. Look at Hebrews later in Hebrews 12, 5 and 6. My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. See, just like us, come on, Mother's Day, you mamas and you daddies. Right. If you love your kids, you're going to discipline them. Right. You're going to you're going to. And, and, and you know, whether it be a punishment from something or a little bit of, you know, discipline on their backside. By the way, there's a difference between abuse and discipline. But but a lot of us in this room can say uh, we were disciplined and we turned out just fine. Right. Amen. And again, we think, oh, no, I don't want to hurt my kids. I don't want to do all that. The Bible actually tells us in Proverbs that if you love your children, you will discipline them. People think not discipline is a sign of love. The Bible says it's the opposite. If you love them, you will. And so it goes back, you know, the Lord says the same thing about us, right? And the writer here in, in Hebrews, he's warning. It's a warning to believers because the writer includes himself. When he writes we, everybody say we. He's including himself when he writes this. I want to read Hebrews 2, 3 in the New King James again. It says, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard it? Notice the Arthur did not say reject, but he used the word neglect. He's not encouraging sinners to become Christians here. He's encouraging Christians to pay attention to our salvation that we, we receive from the Lord. Obviously, there's a lot of scriptures that encourage sinners to get saved. But in this case, remember, he's, he's writing this letter to Jewish Christians. He said, we must listen and pay attention so we don't drift away. Later on in Hebrews 6, 19, the writer uses the illustration of an anchor to show how confident we can be in the word of God and the promises of God. See, I've seen and know there's so many problems, spiritual and other problems that come from born again believers neglecting the true word of God. 
If we neglect God's word and prayer and worship with one another, which he addresses in, in Hebrews 10, 25, and other opportunities to grow spiritually, we will eventually drift off, right? And so I think about this. I've been fishing before, a brother in the church that was here the first service. We've been fishing, and for you fishermen and, and ladies that like to fish, if you've ever fished out of a boat, you know this. You can throw an anchor, and you can put the anchor in the water, and it goes all the way down. It sinks in the mud or sand, whatever you're fishing. But if you don't tie up that rope tight enough, even though the anchor's in the ground, if there's too much slack in the rope, your boat's going to eventually drift off from the good fishing spot you're at. And what happened? The anchor's still there, it's just there's too much slack. Here's what I'm saying. I think too many born-again believers give themselves a lot of slack when it comes to the Word of God. They don't hold to the standard and the truths of the Word of God, and they drift. So guess what? The anchor's still there. We're the one that moves. Amen? We're the one that moves away from the truths and the standards of God's word. Don't get into the lie like, oh man, that's, that's old. I was written by man. Oh, uh, the culture has changed. No, the anchor still holds. Amen. The anchor still holds today. We must continue to obey, live by it, and the anchor is going to hold us where we need to be. Amen. Some people think also that they can sin and not drift, that they can willfully continue to walk in sin and not drift. It's absolutely impossible to sin and not drift. I read a story about a pastor who preached a series on, of sermons uh, on the sins of the saints. He was reprimanded by a member of the church one day, and the member says, after all, pastor, sin in the life of a Christian is different from sin in the lives of other people. The pastor said, yes, you're right. It's worse. And that's so true, right? Lost people, when they're sinning, they, they don't know they're sinning, right? They don't have the revelation of the truth like we have. We know the truth about what sin does in our lives. Do we all sin? Absolutely. Do we all fall short? Absolutely. That's, that's one of the reasons Jesus died. I'm talking about willful, deliberate sin. I'm talking about out, outright rebellion to the Word of God. That's what he's talking about. Drifting from the truths, the standards, the holiness that God is calling us to live. Are y'all tracking with me? The writer of Hebrews tells us that our great salvation, first of all, was announced by the Lord Jesus himself and then delivered to us by others who heard, right? The apostles, the disciples, those that wrote the Bible. That's how we have the Bible, because they delivered what Jesus heard and wrote it down for us. Then he closes the section by saying that that uh, God confirmed this message of salvation by giving us signs, wonders, and various miracles, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I love that. And he's still confirming and doing those things today. See, we can easily drift with the current of the world uh, and sin, but it's much more difficult to return against the stream, right? And let me just encourage you with drifting off, even with that. Even though there's a lot of great men and women of God, and even, you know, some commentary that I used to study, as I was even studying this past week, and I got to that verse about him confirming with many signs, wonders, miracles, and the gift of the Spirit, I read something that that a guy said, well, yeah, you know, and that was 11 times, that was apostolic miracles, and they needed, God was doing miracles because the Word of God wasn't complete, but we don't have any more need for those miracles today. That's a lie from the pit of hell, somebody. Come on. Amen. God is still doing miracles today. I mean, look, little Eliana, she's a great example of that. The doctors couldn't understand it. They couldn't wrap their brain around it, right? There's a young man who was in the first service, and eventually he's going to share with the church that God did a supernatural miracle in his life and is being medically proven. And you've seen it. You've heard it. The gifts are still in operation. Miracles are still happening. Now, again, I think some people go there. Because people have, in the name of the gifts of the Spirit, have done some wonky things. I'm going to use that word again, okay? That's my quote of the day, all right? They've done some weird things in the name of the Holy Spirit that wasn't the Holy Spirit. And so people's pendulums swing all the way. We need to be in the middle. We need to look at the Word of God, not drift away, but still believe that everything the Bible says is true. If Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever, like I just mentioned, why would have miracles and gifts stopped? If he's the same, right? So, but again, everything we do here, everything people have asked us questions about what they've seen at the altar, people falling in the spirit and all different things, praying in tongues, we can all point it back to the word of God. Amen. And let me talk about just again, our salvation it was purchased at such a great price. It brings a great promises and blessings and it leads to a great inheritance. So our salvation itself, we shouldn't neglect. We see all through the Bible in the Old and New Testament that people who have drifted away and even turned away from their salvation altogether. And, and just recently, it seems like in the last month, maybe year, I've gotten the question quite often lately, can you lose your salvation? 
And here's my answer. You can't lose your salvation because you didn't do anything to earn it. But you can turn away from it. You can drift away, and that's what he's warning, right? Again, remember, you can't lose it because that gets into works. Well, if I do this, then will I lose it? No, Jesus died for our sins, past, present, and future. But the Bible warns us. Now, like I said, you can't live in deliberate sin, but you can't, again, just up in one day and lose it because Jesus did it all for us. Amen? Not by works, lest any man should boast. But he does warn us here and many other places that we can fall away and turn away from that salvation. And you can read about that in the book of Matthew. Jesus talked about it and the rest of the New Testament uh, of, of follows the writers in Galatians, 2 Timothy, 2 Peter, 1 John, as well as here in Hebrews. So don't drift away from the word of God. And I want to encourage you, don't turn away from your great salvation that Jesus purchased with his blood. Amen. The writer of Hebrews concludes this section and we'll conclude today and finish chapter two with explaining why Jesus Christ is not inferior to angels just because of his humanity. Now, it's quite a few verses. We're going to we're going to read them all. We're going to dig in Hebrews two verses five through 18. And furthermore, it is not angels who will control the future world we're talking about. For in one place, the scripture says, what are people that you should think of them are the son of man that you should care for them? See, he even refers to people as the son of man or sons of man, right? But but that's that's general for everybody. Yet you made them only a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them authority over all things. Now, when it says all things, it means nothing is left out. But we have not yet seen all things put under their authority. And we do see, what we do see is Jesus, who is given a position a little lower than the angels. And because he suffered death for us, he's now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone, or experienced death is what that means. God for whom and through whom everything was made chose to bring many children into glory. And it was only right that he should make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader fit to bring them into salvation. So now Jesus and the ones he makes Holy have the same father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. For he said to God, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters and I will praise you among your assembled people. He also said, I will put my trust in him. That is, I and the children God has given me. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the sin also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all those who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. I wanted to slow down there for a minute, let you get there. Let's finish up. We also know that the son did not come to help angels. Remember, we just talked about he came to help the descendants, descendants of Abraham. Talking about he didn't come to save the angels. He came to save us. Therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so he could be merciful and a faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Since he himself had gone through suffering and testing, he's able to help us when we're being tested. Now, I know there's a lot there, but the writer focuses, he breaks it down to four things that explain why the Lord's humanity did not uh, was not a mark of inferiority. First of all, Christ's humanity enabled him to regain what we lost. See in verses 5 and 9, the, wrote, the writer's quoting Psalms 8, 4, and 6. See, when God created the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, he gave them dominion over all creation and crowned them with glory and honor. But they lost that crown and became slaves to sin. When they sinned, not only did they lose that, 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 that honor, that glory, that dominion, we did as well because of sin. But Jesus Christ has regained that glory and honor. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Y'all, this is the greatest rescue story ever told or ever, not only told, but that ever happened, right? Things that we forfeited, we lost. Jesus went back and he reclaimed it for us. He got it for us. Amen. One day he will establish his heavenly kingdom. We shall reign with him and glory and honor. That's what it means that it's not for the, the angels to do that. It's for us. Jesus did all of this because of the grace of God. If he had not become a man, he would not have died and experienced death for everyone. He was 100% God, but had to be 100% man to die in our place, to not only forgive us for our sins, but to reclaim what God had originally intended for us. By the way, that that word restore keeps coming up. I've been talking to my wife about it. We've been talking a lot. He came to restore mankind. 
And, and, and I remember Sister Linda, she said it a couple weeks ago. She got a, she felt like she got a word for the Lord, 2023, Psalm 23, specifically, the Lord restores our soul, right? He restores our soul. But you got to understand that word restore in the Bible, it means to restore back to its original intent. It doesn't mean to restore me back to what I was 15 years ago. No, it's to restore back what God originally intended. So Jesus had to come as a man to restore us back to what God originally intended. Amen? Next, Christ's humanity enabled him to bring many into glory. Verses 10 through 13. Christ gave us his glory when he be, gave up him, sorry, gave up his glory to become a man. He left heaven and his, the, the throne and all the glory for us. He regained his glory, though when he rose and ascended into heaven. Now he shares that glory with those uh, who put their trust in him for salvation. And he will bring, it says, many sons and daughters into glory, right? That's awesome. Hebrews 2.12 says that we are his brothers and sisters. This was quoting uh, Psalm 22.22, a messianic psalm in which Christ refers to his church as his brethren. This means we share the same nature and belong in the same family as the Lord Jesus. Verse 13, the writer of Hebrews is quoting Isaiah 8. The immediate reference is that a prophet Isaiah and his unique sons who were given significant names, but the ultimate reference was to Jesus Christ. But not only are we as brothers and sisters. Isn't that a blessing, by the way? That's the mystery. Just like God is fully, Jesus is fully God and fully man. Isn't it the mystery we've been singing about and talking about that he's the eternal king, yet he's still our brother. That's the great man. He's still our Lord and our master, but yet we're still his brothers and sisters. Amen. Then he goes on to say uh, that uh, that we are also indicates in Hebrews 2.13 uh, that the close relationship we have with Jesus because he calls uh, us his children as well, the children of God. So if Jesus Christ did not come to the earth to become a man, he could not take from the earth, take us from this earth to share in his glory. Remember, the incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection must go together. They all lead to glory. Remember, there's three parts of this whole journey. First is justification. When we get saved, it's just as though we've never sinned. Then sanctification, which is the process we're going through. And then one day, because of what Jesus did, it became a man, died in our place, there'll be glorification. Amen? Come on, that's the ultimate goal that we're all going to experience one day. Also, Christ's humanity enabled him to disarm Satan and deliver us from death. Verses 14 through 16, Jesus had to take on flesh and blood himself and become a man. Only then could he die and through his death defeat Satan. So you know what? Satan could only do what God permitted him to do. But because Satan is the author, and we see that in in Job as well. If you read Job 1 and 2, you'll see God permitted Satan to, to mess with Job. But Satan is also the author of sin, and sin brings death. And in this sense, Satan exercises power in the realm of death. But Jesus himself called him a murderer. See, Jesus uses the fear of death as a terrible weapon to gain control over people's lives. His kingdom of one is darkness, one of darkness and death. See, that's why when when, when, when Jesus died, buried, was resurrected, he broke the power of, of death, hell, and the grave, right? Because even though our bodies physically die and he is, he still entices people to sin and they may die a physical death and whatnot. He broke the power ultimately of death in the eternal death. And especially the writer hones in on the fear of death. He said, some live as slaves to the fear of death. And I think, you know, we all have at some point. I know I was before before I got saved. I was talking to a gentleman earlier this week, and he said the same thing. Man, I, I used to be scared to die, but I'm not scared anymore. I'm looking forward to the Lord coming back now, right? As born-again believers, none of us should be scared of death anymore. It's not. It's a glorious thing, amen? Let me just encourage you moms, too. And this is an encouragement. This is not, it, I, I, when I said it, it might kind of sound like it might have been a, a, a correction or rebuke to your moms, but I know that, you know, for some moms, losing your children is the biggest fear you probably have. And I'm not saying, listen, I'm so thankful all four of my children are here, and I can't imagine. I, I, I understand totally. I don't understand. I could about imagine that would be the biggest loss. But any fear is not of God. Okay, only a couple of you got that. Any fear is not of God. So if you walk around with the fear of losing your children, it's not of God. And one of the reasons Jesus came was to broke the, break the power of that fear. So mamas, 
All of us, and I'm a dad, I know moms, it's different. You'll carry the children, you conceive, you give birth to them. But all of us, we can still surrender our children to the Lord. We can walk around free of fear because of what Jesus did. Because he came in a human body and died for our sins. Amen. We who trust Jesus Christ once and for all have been delivered from Satan's authority and from the fear of death. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus gives us victory. Amen. We don't just stop talking about the resurrection after Easter. The resurrection has given us the provision. Jesus himself said, you have authority over all the powers of the enemy. And fear is one of the major tactics that the enemy uses. We have authority over that because of what Jesus has done. Amen. And lastly, Christ's humanity enables him to be sympathetic to us. And that was verses 17 and 18 I read. Verse 17 says, and I'll read this again, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. We're going to get into even more of him being a high priest later, but here he mentions it. He knew, and here's why, he knew what it was like to be human. You ever thought about this? Jesus knew what it was like to be a helpless baby, a growing child, a maturing adolescent. He knew the experiences of being tired and exhausted and weary and hungry and thirsty and discouraged. Remember, he was a 100% man, right? He had all the same emotions we had. So moms, I really want to encourage you now. All of us, but since it's Mother's Day, I want to encourage you moms. I don't know personally, but I know because I've been married to a mom for 20 years now. I, I could imagine how hard it is to be a mama. And there's days where you are exhausted. And there's days where you are discouraged. And there's days where you feel like you, 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 you're giving your all to your children and loving on them and praying for them. And, and as they're growing up, no matter what stage they're at, some of them might even be adults. And I've heard mama say, I know I raised that boy better than that. Right? Come on, you mamas have said that, right? Hey, Jesus knows exactly what you're going through. Even though obviously he's never been a mama, he's been a human. And as our great eye priest, he could sympathize and empathize with us. That's what goes for all of us. But just on in Mother's Day, if you walked in here discouraged and you're, wherever you're at in, in, in your parenting as a mom and dads, wherever you're at, he can sympathize and he can not only sympathize, it's not just this emotional connection. No, he helps us, right? He knew what it was like to be dis- despised, rejected for all of us now, to be lied about, to be falsely accused. Come on, somebody, you ever been falsely accused and lied about? That's not fun, is it? Jesus knows exactly. He was the Messiah and they told him he had a demon. Right? Think about that. Think about the weight of, he was coming to save everybody, save these people, and they're yet accusing him. He knows what that's like. He experienced physical suffering, even death. And all of this is part of his high, of his heavenly ministry as high priest. I love this. Jesus is both merciful and faithful. He's merciful toward people, faithful toward God. He could never fail in his priestly ministry. He made the necessary sacrifice for our sins so that we may be reconciled to God. Amen. So what happens when we save? And again, we're tempted to sin. He stands ready to help us. You remember verse 18, Hebrews 2, 18 says that he'll help us. You know that word help in the Greek actually means, it literally means to run to the cry of a child. So you mamas again, you have the, the natural instinct and when your baby cry, even if your baby's 24, right? But especially as a newborn, you, cr- you run to the cry of that baby. That's the same term. It also literally means to bring help when it is needed. Amen. So what he's saying is that when we're tempted here on earth, you know, he knows what it's like. See, Jesus has been tempted in every way we have, yet did not sin. That's the key. That's how he became the perfect spotless lamb and the perfect high priest, because Jesus was tempted, the Bible says, in every way, yet he did not sin. But he understands the temptation. So guess what? Angels can't help us when we're being tempted. Jesus can, and he will. Amen? And so I want to encourage you with that, whether you're a mom or anybody else in here dealing with any kind of temptation, Call upon him. He's helped you. He'll give you the strength and the grace that you need, right? Only Jesus can do this. Only he can truly help us by his spirit to become, because he became a man and suffered and died and became our high priest. Amen. So in closing, man, as we finish up this section, I know it was a lot. You know, you can't help but be amazed at the wisdom and the grace of God. When Jesus Christ became a man, he did not become inferior to the angels for his his human body, he accomplished something that the angels could never accomplish, right? He's superior and he accomplished for us in all humanity. At the same time, 
he made it possible for us to even one day share in his glory. So I'll close with saying this. He's not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. Are you ashamed to call him Lord? Come on, somebody. Are you ashamed? I hope you're not. I want to read a few more scriptures again before we close. Then we're going to pray Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 again. I have two questions to ask you before we leave. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. I hit on this earlier, but I want to pray through this now. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. If you're living constantly with the fear of dying, I've learned that chances are it's because you don't know where you're spending your eternity at. See, if you know where you're going to be as soon as you breathe your last, there shouldn't be a fear of dying. Most people that fear dying is because they don't know what happens after death. Come on, y'all, it's laid out in the scriptures clearly. We're going to experience glory with them. We're going to have glorified bodies, the Bible says. If you're dealing with sickness and pain in your body, yes, I still believe God can heal you on this side of the earth. But if he doesn't, or if you like me and you know what, it seems like calories keep sticking to you more and more every year you live. Come on, we're going to have glorified bodies. Amen. Come on, we're going to eat all kind of good food at the mass supper of the lamb and, and, and have any effect on our glorified bodies. So if you know that's the future, living in, with Jesus in his presence, we shouldn't have any fear of dying. So do you have that fear of dying? And secondly, Hebrews 2.17 says, and then he could offer a sacrifice that could take away the sins of the people. You remember last week, chapter 1 says, only he could die to take away our sins. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me? Just out of reverence for the Lord and respect for others around you. This is a twofold question. But the solution, I guess, so to speak, or the answer would be the same. Do you live with a constant fear of dying? Jesus came to break that fear. It says that we are, and I know I was one of them, enslaved to the fear of dying. Have you been forgiven of your sins? Have you asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins? Do you know where you're going to spend eternity? Either one of those, if you say, Brandon, I do, man. I, nobody's looking around. Even if you're watching at LPCC today. So good to have you, brothers and sisters, with us. Say, so, yeah, man, I, I fear dying. I, that's a constant thought. I would challenge you, and maybe because you're not fully, you're not really born again, or you haven't fully surrendered. If you say, Brandon, I don't know, I don't know where I would spend my eternity. We all gonna spend it somewhere. The Bible makes it clear: heaven or hell. There's no holding place. There's no middle ground. It's appointed for man to die once. After that comes judgment. If you say, Brandon, that's me, man. I've been living with a fear of death, and I'm unsure where I'm going. But today, I want to surrender my life to Christ. If that's you, just slip up your hand. Say, man, I don't want to live like this anymore. That's me. That's me. Come on, just lift up your hand. I see your hands going up. Come on, keep your hands up high. Lift them up. Lift. It's sign of surrender over here in the back, in the middle. I see hands going up. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Say, man, I want to surrender my life. The Bible says if, if you, 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 you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, Jesus is Lord. And that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Come on, it's not this prayer we're about to pray that saves you. It's your faith. I'm just leading you in a declaration. Come on, I want to encourage you to surrender and put your faith and trust in God. Those of you with your hands raised, the rest of us, we're going to pray this together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to the earth in a human body to take my place and dying on the cross for me. Lord, I know that I've sinned and I repent of my sin. I turn to you and I surrender to you. Lord, would you help me to live for you all the days of my life? Holy Spirit, give me the power and the strength and the grace that I need to walk this journey and glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Come on, can we rejoice with these that made that declaration and surrendered their life to Christ? Hey, this is only the beginning today. This is only the beginning. If you made that decision, you need to get connected. You need to go jump into Next Steps next week. It's Mother's Day. We're not going to have it today. We're, it's uh, um, Get a Bible. Fill out the connection card and chair in front of you. Grab a Bible in the info center. Jump in a life group. Let us pray for you. We want to pray for you because your journey begins now. That journey of sanctification, of discipleship begins. Would you stand up with me now? And don't leave. We're going to leave here in a few minutes. I'll let you go take your picture. But let's pray. I want to pray against that, 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 that spirit of fear, of people living under the fear of death or even any, uh, any other fear. Amen. 
And I just want to pray over you as we leave today. Come on, would you do me a favor? Just bow your head and close your eyes one more time and say, Brandon, that's me. I'm there with, maybe it's not the fear of death, but some kind of other fear. Would you be bold and just lift your hands? Say, man, that's me. I've been dealing with fear lately. Say, that's me. Come on, lift up your hands to the Lord. That's me. I've been dealing with fear. Come on, let's just come against that and break that today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bind up the spirit of fear. I thank you, Father. You have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Whether it's the fear of death, fear of loved ones or children dying, fear of the future. Lord, we thank you. You have already laid out a glorious future for us, Father. We love you. We thank you. We give you all the glory. We just ask, Lord God, your peace and your grace. I pray another blessing over our mamas today. As they go, Lord, they feel honored and appreciated. Lord, we lift them up to you. Draw us closer to you and closer to each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, we love you. God bless you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. If y'all need prayer for anything specifically or anything else, we'll be up here. Have a great day. God bless y'all.